And we'll record to the cloud. So welcome everybody. I would like to introduce the world famous Kathy Goche. Kathy spent many years curling with Connie Laliberti, and then most recently she played with Jennifer Jones. She won two championships with Connie and she won one uh, with Jennifer Jones. She left Jennifer due to family commitments and now Kathy is with TSN. So we are going to get the benefit of Kathy's experience as an athlete, as a TSN broadcaster, and also as a coach because Kathy is now working with her daughter's team. And I believe you've coached Jacques as well. Yep. I, when he was really little, but I definitely coached some junior men's teams back in the 80s and then some Scotty's teams. And so, yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome, Kathy, and take it away. The floor is all yours. Right. Well, thank you, Andrea, and thank you all um, for joining tonight. Um, I saw the names Andrea shared, and I'm very honored and flattered that a lot of you felt that there might be something that I could share today that um, would be useful for you to either take for yourself or to share with others. Um, I always think back to, you know, CEO of Microsoft, Bill Gates, always says that what he feels that he does best is share his enthusiasm. Um, I feel that way about myself. Um, unfortunately, I don't make his money with my enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> but I do love this game. I love the people around the game. I, they're just amazing. And so I'm trying to, when I put this together, to filter in how I felt as a player how I see things as a coach and that 36,000 foot look you get um, as, a, as a broadcaster. So if I can only make this slide presentation go now. Hang uh, on a second. Bottom. Jacques, can you come over here and help me make this happen? Bottom left-hand corner, hover over the bottom left-hand corner. I don't have a bottom left-hand corner. Oh. It won't. Shoot, we just had it up. Well, it's because uh, like Jock will figure it out. He's a smart boy. He is. So um, we're seeing your screen. Well, yeah, but I can't advance it. Oh, mm -hmm. I am going to advance it. I don't know if it's going to. Uh, I'm going to have to. It's not working. All right. See, as a world champion, he has learned how to help his mother. <laughs> So our game plan for the next 45, I wanted to talk about off ice preparation and it's not the physical and the mental, the stuff that we usually really focus on. I'm taking that as a given that those things people know are really important, but we are in a very unique time. Um, no one asked for COVID and we'd all love it to go away really quickly. But you know, normally by this time of the year, you'd be just on the ice all the time. Uh, right now, we have a unique opportunity to spend time with our athletes and our teams to do things that I think are as important as uh, fixing the intern and the outturn as they are. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about defining roles and responsibilities, uh, our roles as coaches, uh, not only as we see them, but the players see them, um, and also the teams themselves. <laughs> The magic elixir is what I call it. What makes teams really perform well at big events, be that a national championship, a world championship, uh, first time at a U18, whatever that looks like, and where teams really struggle. And there are definitely some common things that I see from the booth every year I'd like to share. The words from a champion, uh, beyond the fact that he told me how to make my uh, PowerPoint work, I've asked Jacques, to talk for the last five to seven minutes and stay for the Q's and A's. Um, he had a phenomenal year last year as a fairy tale ending, but it didn't start that way. And sharing what happened last year to him, um, the role of the coach, how that all came about. Um, and so he's gonna be a part of it. Instead of me sharing what he went through, he'll tell you what he went through and then some time for Q's and A's. So the better ice, uh, off ice preparation, um, again, these are the things that are the intangibles. And the things I want to stop, talk about are how we borrow from professional sport. I think that there's opportunities there that we don't always take advantage of. How to create intensity uh, with your teams. How to use streaming for more than just sharing. 
And the single biggest thing I think that we can give to our athletes is to teach them how to learn to live in the moment. So what does that look like? Well, that's the Kansas City Chiefs. And if you follow Super Bowl at all, they are the Super Bowl champions. When we talk about NFL, uh, they have incredible intensity. Some of the things they do early on is they bring in college teams. Well, if you have a six foot five, 350 pound linebacker coming at you, you're gonna find intensity pretty quickly because you don't wanna get run over. It's really hard for us in curling at practices to create that kind of intensity, especially if you have individuals and teams that throw rocks every day. The focus is tough, the intensity is tough, but it is finding intensity that helps you translate that. So for example, we need to find ways to simulate what our game is. And the best example I can give of that is a player uh, no longer playing. Her name was Dordie Nordby. She represented Norway at three Olympics, 10 worlds and 22 Europeans. And like many European countries, there are not a lot of depth. So people could say, well, yeah, of course she got out every year, but she also won back to back world championships at a time when Europeans did not come to Canada to train. And she did it by having two and a half hour practices. And she felt that you can't replicate something if you don't actually do it. So with her, it was about trying to simulate what the game is. And for us, it's tougher, but even simple things. Often at practices, I'll say, okay, we're gonna do this and this for the first 40 minutes. And then we're gonna have two on two and I'll bring Tim cards or Starbucks cards. And it is amazing what people will do for $5. But all of a sudden you get that intensity that's created that you wouldn't normally get if you say, okay, we're gonna play two on two. It's very, very tough. Studies show that teams practice with a minimum of 20% less focus than they do in a game. And focus is tough, especially if you're working with younger athletes. Instagram, PS4s, everything that works really fast in their head makes it really tough to slow a brain down. Pediatricians say that you should take away any electronic devices from your children at least two hours before they go to bed because that's how their brains slow to the point that they can actually relax. And for athletes, it's actually focus. So the rule should be from the time you walk in the building, your phone gets shut off. You have your pregame meeting, there's no phones so that you can actually start to focus. So important. Then we move to the repetition. Uh, the best example I can think of is Brendan Botcher. As you look at him on the left, when he shared last year at the Briar, that for every practice that is an hour and a half that they do, they do one shot for the entire practice. So he'll send a note and say, today's practice is the intern on the four foot line. And that is all they will throw for that hour and a half until it gets the same result. Not the same throws, but the same result. It is that repetition, repetition. Uh, Lee Trevino, the famous golfer, was asked once what the difference is between a really good golfer and a professional. And he said, it's about 500,000 golf shots a year. So it's not talent, it's what you do with it. And so Jacques and I tried to calculate what it might be for curling and probably a top team is throwing at least a thousand rocks more than a really, really good say travelers team or a club team. So it is that repetition. And sometimes we have to share with our teams why repetition is important. If they follow curling at all, Brendan Botcher is a great guy to emulate. He is an engineer. He breaks this game down to a science and it's worth reinforcing. The Mark the Machine on the right uh, is the story that <clears throat> many of you may not know, which is when we did all of that fabric testing a couple of years ago, when they were trying to figure out which fabric was the least scratching of the ice. And they brought in a material physicist from Harvard to take a look at things. And they had players from across the country. They had the World Curling Federation. They had a rock throwing machine because they wanted to have similar weights and they ran into trouble with it. Uh, Mark Kennedy was one of the players there. He threw a hundred rocks in a row and he knew within 0.02 if he had thrown, if he had thrown a little harder or a little less. And they quickly realized that he was more accurate than the rock throwing machine. 
And that comes from repetition over and over and over. So practices can feel boring, but I think we need to tell athletes examples like this to have them understand the value of doing some of these things that we want them to do. The streaming for more than just sharing is I think that it's tough to go into a curling club now without having coaches everywhere or even players are streaming. So many players use it as an opportunity to not only share with family and friends that can't come, particularly in COVID, the last two spiels in Manitoba, each team was allowed one fan per team. So you want to share with your friends at home. It's a way to give some sponsors um, some props too. So it's great. And often when I watch coaches, they'll take maybe one or two shots from the game to use that streaming to go through. But again, borrowing from the NBA, the MLB, NFL, they use tapes as their principal training tool to watch what offense is, what defense, what do different skips do? What does team Cooey do when they're up to down to? You take, you don't have to go that way if you're teaching a junior team, but you can watch the streaming of other teams, your competitors, what do they do? What can you anticipate? It's great for juniors when you talk about body language. What happens when you gave up three? You see the shoulder slump. You can talk to them about body language, but nothing beats showing it. Take some games that, you know, they performed really well. Take some games where you can identify some things, not just strategy, but where some fun things happened or where body language led to an impact on other members of the team. It's a great way to share. Everyone loves to watch themselves on TV and on playbacks. Have popcorn nights. It's a really safe thing to do in the bubbles that we're finding ourselves in. And you can also build practice plans with the team when you say, okay, see where you're sweeping. You're not sweeping this part. These tapes are the number one thing that professional teams do. And in our sport, I don't think we do it enough. Come on, turn, go. I'm trying to make, there we go. This is to me the single best thing that you can do for your athletes. We are so focused in our world about thinking ahead. Uh, in sport, we have the long-term or uh, athletic development model where we really try to develop athletes. When we sit down as coaches in the beginning of the year, we set goals for our teams. Where do we want to go? Um, if you're dealing with students, it's all about exams and time. Everything is about the future, but we don't live in the present. And so we don't give all we can give to the current situation. On the left, the woman that you see is Felicia George. She was one of Canada's top hurdlers. And her story that I read years ago has stuck with me forever. And she was training for the Olympics to represent Canada. And it was a pretty much a shoe in unless she fell on a hurdle that she was gonna qualify, but she wanted more than that. She wanted to win the Olympics. So they had done all the benchmarking about where she had to be at certain events with time. And the first couple of events she went in, she surpassed the time that she wanted, um, but didn't make the time that she needed on her development plan. And she actually considered just hanging it up and decided not to, to do it. And on her last meet, she went into it and she said for the first time that day, she looked at the sky, realized that it was blue, made eye contact with some fans, saw that there were people with her name on signs and ran in the moment and crushed her personal record. And it speaks volumes to when people relax and enjoy the moment, they perform at a much higher level. And that's the other visual. Uh, Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world. And if you guys watched Andrew DeGrasse, he was supposed to be at the Olympics as a training ground for this coming Olympics. But he developed this little brotherhood with Usain Bolt. And this was a race in which he crushed, like didn't just beat, but crushed his personal record, crushed a Canadian record. And he's coming across smiling because he is embracing the moment and living in it. And that is something we don't do enough of is reminding our athletes to enjoy the experience. When Jacques was in the world final, um, I was broadcasting at the Scotties. And Rachel Holman and Jennifer both sent a little clip to Jacques 
And the overall message was, you know, we're cheering for you, but live in the moment, enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. TSN bets me every year that I cannot do an interview with Jennifer in which she won't say fun. I have asked her the most innocuous questions that she can't possibly get the word fun in, but she finds a way. And I'm always in the middle of the interview and they're always in my ear going, you're a loser, but I can't get her to say anything. I played with Jennifer. I know it's not always fun, but they have had that reinforced to them that if you're not having fun, then you're in the wrong place. The late, great Janet Arnett that coached them for many years left every fifth end conversation with, remember, this is your choice. So we all have to work, we have to go to school, we have to do all those things, but curling is a sport that we all choose to do. And sometimes it starts to feel like a grind um, and you need to always remember that you're doing it because you love it and you have a passion for it and the results will be much better. I became a way better player when I quit watching Sheet C to see if somebody was winning that might help my pool. I can't influence that but I can influence how good I am on my sheet. So this defining roles and responsibilities, just shifting tracks, um, really calls into question, first of all, what is your definition, definition of a coach and is it what the team wants? Coaches are very different now and I think it's important that that conversation really happens. How you can share the wealth of your knowledge but not carry the entire load for the team and then when we look at roles and responsibilities for the teams, I wanna talk about how you can encourage your team to really embrace their positions and how you can push them um, to find sense. So here's two examples of coaches I'd like to talk about first. On the left, uh, for those of you that don't know, that's Tom Clasper. He's been associated with quite a few uh, top level junior teams coming out of Manitoba. We brought Tom into the coaching world in 1993 after we went to a Canadian Scotties in 92 with Connie without a coach. On the final game of the round robin, we ran into a pretty significant issue. Um, there was officiating problems. There was a challenge with Curling Canada about the resolution of it. There were no skill-based competitions at the time. So we were kind of, everybody was making it up as we went along. And rather than being able to leave the building, we were either going to get a bye to the final, there was only three teams, or we were going to be in a tiebreaker. And rather than being able to leave, Janet and I stayed for probably two or three hours to try to work it out. We were asked to come back first thing the next morning to resolve it one more time before we would have to go on to play two games to win Canada. And when we left there that year, we said, we need somebody. We don't want to have to carry this. So Tom came in as a coach, but our ask of him was because we really liked his mannerisms. He was a guidance counselor. He's very respectful of people. We wanted him to deal with the stuff so that we could just curl. Now, if you're the kind of coach that wants to be out there for a timeout, it would have been a very frustrating year because that's not the kind of things that we wanted. Jules Ochar on the right is... Uh, very well known, mostly from his relationship with Kevin Martin, having um, run the curling program at Nate, where Kevin went to school. But when he retired, Kevin, I mean, he, Jules was flooded with people that wanted him. He is considered the best rock matcher in the country and potentially the world by most teams. Jules is never going out for a timeout. He's not running practices. He's not coordinating sponsors. He is there for that specific purpose. So as a coach, that role definition is critical because one of the most painful things to watch on TSN is coaches come out for a timeout and the teams are not interested in what that person has to say. It's embarrassing for the coach. It's very, very tough. Um, or the coaches that come out and say, well, what do you think? The players need to know what you think. That's why you're out there. And that conversation needs to happen well before any event that your coach can come out. Again, it's clarity. All of these roles are about coaching, but it's what is it that you want? And are you comfortable with that? The sharing the wealth 
Um, I've got four pictures of people I have incredible respect for on the screen, but they all have very different strengths. Andrea, you'll recognize in the top left, obviously <laughs> a great coach of Team Mada, Team Holman, and many others. But what I think that Andrea has an incredible strength in is team dynamics. I have used her with teams that I have coached for the better part of 10 years. And a case in point, uh, the team that I coach had a they were first year team last year, had a very successful year, but there were some issues. And my concern was the last time we played together was a provincial Scotties. We're going to start this year and the same issues would come back. Andrea did the start, stop, continue drill. And by her managing it, two things happened. One, I was able to participate and that's always good. The other is, especially if you have coaches who have a family member, a son, a daughter, a sister, and anything on the team, it is so much nicer to have an impartial third party that keeps the conversation unbiased. There's no perception of anything other than they're trying to help. That's where you may have the skill set, but why wouldn't you bring in somebody that is a neutral party? Underneath uh, Andrea is Earl Morris, probably uh, one of the most respected men, not only as a great player, but a great coach. But he stopped coaching Rachel when he said he would go out for timeouts and they weren't interested in listening. And if you look at their relationship now with Marcel Rock, they absolutely listen. Is it about Earl? No. But at that time, it had stopped happening. So again, you need to have the comfort of role of what you as a coach are going to do. The two on the right, uh, Adams Kingsbury uh, brought a whole new dynamic to curling. He's an analytics guy. Uh, he really watched his team behavior. You're never going to see Adam go out for a timeout because he's got a defined role. His time is before the game and after. John Dunn on the corner, a noted uh, University of Alberta sports psychologist, spends a lot of time with uh, Team Cooey and continues his quest to make them play faster. It's not going so well. Um, <laughs> but again, he's not ever going out there. So my point is that, you know, on a team like ours, uh, we bring in Carrie Burtnick to talk about strategy. We bring in Reed Carruthers to talk about strategy. We bring in Andrea to do team dynamics. Could I do all those things? Sure. But it's nicer for the teams to have different voices. And the one thing I will, I have no scientific proof of this, but I believe it in my heart, is that if you have a top level team and you reach out to a competitive curler in your province and say, would you talk to these people for an hour? There are very few that would say no. One of the first phone calls Jacques got after he won the world was from Mark Kennedy, who spent about an hour and a half with him and then said, if you ever wanna talk, call me. There is nothing more flattering to an athlete to have somebody they respect offer their advice. And especially now we're in a virtual world, it's not a big ask and there's a lot of rewards. Ah, come back. Okay, here we go. Technology is not my strength. Sorry guys, I'm trying to get the middle one. Easy, way. easy. yeah, my son's yelling easy. So <laughs> the embracing the position is driving for excellence. So this is a lousy shot on the left and I apologize, this guy did not just get cut. Um, I was trying to find a visual to show that to be the best on the ice, you need to understand what your teammates need off of it. So what I was trying to portray is that this guy needs alone time. And I think so often with curling, we feel everybody has to be together all the time. And especially at high pressure events, you don't. Everybody needs different things. When I was with Connie and Jennifer, they needed rest. So even though I roomed with them, I left. I spent hours by a pool reading a book by myself or walking because I needed them to be able to play really well. And that's what they needed. So find out, take the time now to find out what each player, what they do under stress, where do they go? What do they need so that when they step on the ice, they're as ready as they can be because you've given them the mental health that they need, the physical rest that they need, the whatever. Uh, that, that is even things like, when do you get to the arena? When I played with Jennifer, Jill wanted to be at buildings 45 minutes before a coin toss. 
I lost my mind. That was way too much for me. I wanted 20 minutes. So we tried going back and forth and it either meant that Jill was really uncomfortable because she felt rushed or I was uncomfortable because I felt like I'd been there for three days. So we split the difference and we both learned to deal with the fact that maybe we weren't getting what we want, but it wasn't as bad as the other side. The other part of it in terms of embracing the position is I wish we could remove from our vocabulary, you know, I'm moving down to lead or I'm moving down to second. No, anybody that's ever played on a team or watched a team or coached a team where the lead's not very good, you know, you're in trouble 100% of the time. And players that were looking at Brianne Mayer and Shannon Burchard both came as skips to Carrie Anderson's team. And except for COVID, we could be talking about a world championship team right now. And one of the things that people said is it's never going to work. They're all skips, they're all skips. But I talked to both Shannon and Brianne and said, how did you deal with it? And what they said is that they agreed that they needed to talk strategy, but they would talk about it to each other from their end. And given that Val had a soft shot game and Carrie liked to hit, they felt that there would be enough shots discussed. But what they did that I think is something that every team should do is they each chose three players in their position that they thought did really good things. So who was the great brusher? Um, in second, Shannon said she found people that threw the most weight well. Uh, what were their antics on the ice? What did they do? Three Canadian players and one international player because they approached the game differently. And what they did is they took the best parts of each player, tried to roll them up in a ball and say, that's who I'm going to become. So they spent all of their time trying to own their position instead of getting in the way of the back end. And if you happen to be coaching people who think they are the best in their position, then challenge them to push the envelope because I can guarantee you that the people that are almost as good as them are working twice as hard to be that person. So those are some of the things that you can consider. The magic elixir. So that's uh, one of the final things I wanted to talk about are what are those things that teams do at national championships that reap the success well first of all they come in very prepared technically mentally physically no surprise there uh they talk to the ice maker on every draw somebody from the team talks to the ice maker i talk to the ice maker before every draw at tsn and almost always there's something new they've had to start the ventilation system it's going to kick out at the fifth end well what does that mean well it might mean that it might get slicker on the outside sheet um, did they change the pebble head because they're clipping too much? Ice makers are great resources that people often talk to once in an event and assume the conditions will stay the same. They don't, they change all the time. And the really good teams realize that that is a resource that they can use. Uh, the teams that do well are really well planned in terms of getting rid of distractions. They know in the morning when they're gonna go to the building, when they're gonna leave, where's their pregame, where's their postgame, where they're going to eat so that they, they don't have anything to worry about and they're not standing at the door wondering where Susan is and why they can't leave. Those are the distractions that cause extra anxiety, especially if you've lost. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I think that they do is they do more of the same. They don't change things up because it's a national championship. I remember the morning of a world final, Bill Shearhart, who has done a lot of work for Curling Canada, coming in and saying to us, you know, the rocks don't know that this is a world final. The ice doesn't know it's a world final. So they're going to do the same things as long as you do the same things with them, which is great advice. It's, uh, it's a big game, but it breaks down to just throwing the rock the same way they always have. And the other things that really great teams do is they realize that playing in any big event is an opportunity. It's not a burden. You can't go in thinking this is my last year of juniors or I come from a tough province. I may never get out again. It puts all this extra pressure on you. I always think back to the 2005 shot that Jennifer made uh, that we keep saying over and over again. And I remember reporters saying to her after, what was your thought process in the hack? And she said, it was, Jennifer, you have waited your entire life to make a shot like this. What an opportunity. 
So seeing things as opportunities creates better results. The other side of the coin are teams that come and struggle. And some of it is just black and white, it's talent. You have teams that are just not as good. But the two biggest things they try to do is they try to change things that they haven't done all year. Inevitably, we see teams calling a tick shot when they're one up and they've never done that. And you can tell from the look on the lead's face when they're yelling, what are we doing? That's a clue. Um, you know, what, what kind of weight do you want? They're completely thrown off. And then that creates all this extra anxiety. And you often see that on the, the teams that maybe aren't supposed to beat the bigger teams and they start to panic. There's no need to. Whatever got you to the show and whatever got you to the ninth and one up is probably pretty good. And you're better to go around a guard if that's what you've done and make it than try a tick shot and not make it. And the single biggest thing is everybody wants to help. All of a sudden we have four skips on a team. We have everybody, we're playing to qualify in a spiel. Now everybody has an opinion. Uh, we're playing in a playoff game. Everybody has an opinion and God bless you all that coach juniors. You get to the Canadians, all of a sudden every parent is a strategist and you're trying, <laughs> I, got, I got a thumbs up. And you've got people that even if you're a great curler, it doesn't matter, you've not been involved so far. And so those are the things that happen. These are the other influences that have a huge impact. Uh, and all of a sudden you've got a skip who's lost his or her way because they have all this extra stuff uh, that's coming in that they not planned for and they're trying to be politic and they're trying to deal with it. And that's one of the single biggest contributors to teams that don't do well. Um, is people just trying to help a little bit too much. So that's kind of some of the feedback. I hope that was helpful and you found something interesting. I thought that because there were so many changes in his year and we talk about coaching and what works, that because I just happened to have somebody dwelling in my basement uh, who is a recent world champion who's been through quite a bit in the last year, that's his longtime coach. Uh, John Lund, they have a wonderful relationship. And I thought that um, I would ask Jock to talk about last year and the role of John and what he learned from his first Canadians um, to his maybe last and how he feels that we can help to better prepare coaches. Jock, I turn it over to you. Thanks, mom, I guess. Uh, <laughs> most of this is basically just echoing what she, can you mute yourself? Uh, I'm trying to mute myself. Andrew, can you mute me? No. Uh, I can um, I think, hang on. Or like, can you mute your volume? So I'm not echo. Oh, I muted. Andrea, it. I don't think you need to. Oh. Shut yours off and come sit here. Okay. I just. Um, I Put your thing back up. Uh, you're uh, muted now, Kathy. Jock, you should be good. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> a little technical, but sure. Anyway, so a lot of what I'm going to say is just echoing what, uh, what she said in the presentation. Um, last year, obviously, we ended off with a lot of success, but the beginning of the season did not have that at all. Um, we came into the season with, as she said, we almost had four skips. We had four individuals on the team, um, and we weren't gelling quite as we wanted to, but we never really panicked because Something that my team has always done is we tried to set some sort of event as a benchmark in the season where we can realistically evaluate if we're meeting our expectations. So for us, it was always the Ottawa Super Spiel because it gave us a couple months into the season to practice and try to gel as a team. And it was also when we're playing against competition that's pretty reflective of what we would hopefully get to play at a national championship. And so the previous two years, we had success winning and losing a final in the, in the previous two years but last year we won our first two and then crashed and burned and lost three straight and so it kind of left us reeling trying to figure out where to go and so John was huge in this because he facilitated this team discussion that was almost kind of awkward to initiate but once we got going we got talking about what we were doing right but mostly what we could improve on and it wasn't just um, you know, as a team, maybe we're playing this way, we shouldn't be. It's what each individual can do and what each individual can strive to work on uh, in order for us to accomplish our ultimate goal, which was winning the Canadian juniors. 
And so personally, um, a lot of what I had to do was be a little bit more receptive as to how we're calling the game strategically. Uh, I was playing a little bit more aggressive than our team liked. And so by virtue of John asking, you know, if our team liked the way we were playing the game, I found out that we, we thought we were playing too aggressive. And so it was an easy switch. Um, but the biggest thing for me personally was mentally. Um, a lot of my struggles at the beginning of the year had to do with me thinking about uh, being afraid to miss. So if I'm drawing against three of the four foot, I'm more scared of missing and saying, well, if I miss the score is this and the game's practically over as opposed to uh, kind of as said in the presentation, it's an opportunity to get one, right? Only all I have is a draw to the four foot for one. It, life could be way worse. I could have a run double to concede or something like that. And so I, I mentally switched how I approached shots and how I approached games and it ended up working out. Um, as far as Nat's experience, the biggest thing that I think I learned was getting to use what they give you. And so what I mean by that is after all the draws, you get uh, post-game practice and stuff like that. And in our first couple of years, we never used the post-game practice. And we didn't think that there was much use for it. Like at night, just you know, going to throw a 1030, what's the big deal? It's smudgy out there. It's not really a good use of our time but this year we did and it it really helped us because at a certain point in a lot of championships are a bit extended like a national or provincial there's lots of times you get bad tendencies that flare up so for me personally I couldn't throw um, an intern peel off the line and uh, we ended up going there and I threw about eight in a row felt good about it and then I didn't have to really go back to fix anything and then lo and behold in the Canadian final I'm playing an intern off the line for two. And it's just kind of funny how that worked out. And then the biggest one um, as well is uh, when we're talking about Jules Ochar, we learned how important pre-event practice can be. So before an event, we always thought we were just wasting our time out there because the ice conditions are very, very commonly different than they're going to be during the, uh, during the event. But what you can do is you can match rocks and be comfortable with what you're throwing. So what we always did is look at our round robin, who we're playing on what sheet, what color we're probably going to be. Sometimes you can't control it, but that's just the way it is. But um, what color we're going to be and then try to match those rocks just to see if there's any sort of initial thing that we can point out that's bad and just get people throwing a pair of rocks that they're comfortable with. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is just preparing for big events. So again, the bit like, as my mom said, the biggest thing is not to overemphasize. There's a reason if you're playing in a big event, there's a reason that you're there. And so you can't stray from what worked to get you there. For us, um, John was a huge, huge part of that. There's actually a video of us walking into the arena in Krasny Arskin. As you can actually kind of tell from that picture, they had it all done up. It was a brand new arena. It's two years old. And the first thing he said to us is that they – the game's not different. We still got to make shots. We're still here to play curling. It, it doesn't get any harder um, than it needs to be. You don't need to make it harder on yourself because we're in a nice building. So it kind of gave us a bit of perspective that although we were at the Worlds, it was still the same game and that we still had to approach the game the same way, both strategically and mentally. We couldn't just, uh, you know, say, well, we're scared to not qualify because we're team Canada we had to say well it's an opportunity to win for Canada kind of deal so uh, yeah I definitely like the that part of the presentation and that's pretty much it for me but if you have any questions I'm happy to answer um, I have a quick question Jacques when you're matching rocks in your pre uh, competition practice and you know that you're going to be throwing both sets of rocks on that sheet do you give priority to one set of rocks or the other, or the rocks for a certain position or another? Yeah, that's a great question. What we tended to do is that we would prioritize the rocks we're going to throw first. So let's say we're on sheet C, we're scheduled to play on sheet C in games three and eight. Well, in game three, the rocks that we're throwing will be more similar to how we're throwing them in pre-event practice, especially if they've just sharpened them because by the time we get to game eight, they might dull out. They might be running a little bit different. So I would say definitely it's more of a priority if you're going to use those rocks um, sooner than later. 
And another thing too, is it's very, very important if, you know, you have a massive matchup, like let's say we're playing, you know, in Alberta or something like that, or in Ontario on sheet C, we're going to make sure that we really pay attention to those rocks. Those are two things to watch. What's that? Tell them that you threw them off. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what, what we did is we found two guys on our team that we thought threw the same, could throw the same every single time. So kind of relaying back to the Mark Kennedy thing. And, um, Jordan, my third's out turn and my intern, I thought were part, two of the most consistent throws on the team. And for me, I love being able to throw all eight because I could pick the two rocks that I liked the best and then be absolutely confident in the two rocks that I was throwing. And then for Jordan, it was the same thing. So the two, the last four rocks on the team um, were picked by the people throwing them. So it was just, it, instead of having, you know, a fifth go out there, and throw the rocks and tell you, well, this rock's good. This rock's bad. We at least got to throw them and see for ourselves. Good. Okay. Let's, uh, let's unmute everybody. Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like as well. Um, I'm just going to um, take back the screen sharing. I hope this is going to take it back to me. Yep. Okay. So now if you go up to the top and you might see a gallery view up on the top on my screen, it's the top right hand corner You click on that and then you can see everybody and people can open up their mics themselves if they're not already open and any questions, any comments. Thank you, Kathy. That was, um, that was great. Good examples and great experiences. Does anybody else have any other questions? So I, I have a question for Kathy. Sure. So Kath, um, so I've coached both men's teams and women's teams. And what I found is that with men's teams, I can do the kinds of things that you talked about at the beginning of your talk about uh, doing things like, uh, you know, competing against each other in practice and, you know, putting things on the line. So when I coached, Laurier in 2016, and we ended up winning Canadians. I had a devil of a time getting those guys to commit to practice. Just, just, it was hard. So I would, every practice, take $20 out of my wallet and say, okay, hey guys, we're, we're practicing for beer money. Here's what we're doing. <laughs> and, and they would do it. And you just watch the, intensity ramp up, you know, as soon as something was on the line. Right. But in my experience, coaching women's teams, that does not happen. <laughs> and I've tried it and to a team, they've all looked at me like I'm from another planet and going, well, gee, Glenn, why would we do that? <laughs> so What's your experience and do you have any, like, cause I know you coach your daughter. So when you coach Gaetan's team, like what do you do with them in order to try to get that compete level to be a little higher? It's, it's a great question. And, you know, I see the dynamics play out in my household all the time, right? Because I've got Gaetan and I've got Jacques who were both going through a lot of the similar things. Um, you know, as you say, with guys, it's easy. I find that um, when Jock was with JT, because JT was um, the ice guy at Assiniboine, that yeah. that's what they would do on a Friday or Saturday night. They'd go at 10 o'clock, they'd kick people out, and they would just throw rocks as a, as a form of entertainment. Not a lot of women are doing that. Uh, in coaching the women's teams that I have, um, it's not since juniors, I think, that there's been issues with getting players out to practice. Um, at this point, if they don't want to throw, if they're not committed, then it's pretty hard to force people to be committed. And you really want to find a team where you have four players who are committed right. and sure. who want yeah. to do it. But I do, um, I definitely do the Starbucks cards. Uh, they're all too foo-foo for Tim's. So that's my preference. Um, but they, it's, it is crazy. I will put them at the end of the sheet. Um, and that is like a driver to have them ramp up the intensity. Otherwise I do feel some nights like I'm watching them go through the motions and they're thinking about, you know, 
when they can get home and yeah. what they can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I hear you. Yeah, I I have found it's it's much much easier with guys than it is with yeah. with I would, female I, athletes. Yeah, I would concur. Although I would ask Jacques because. He dates Carly Burgess, who won the world last yeah, year yeah. as well from Nova Scotia. And they seem to have a pretty strong work ethic. Do you know what they do at their practices to maintain intensity? Uh, they're all just nutcases. Like they, they <laughs> just love to throw and yeah. Hard to, it's hard to teach that. They're just, they're just naturally like that. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big collectivist culture on that team. It's all, it's very, very team focused. It's not individual. I guess that's the only thing. Not nobody cares. Well, about so, so, but yeah, you're right. But that's, you know, exactly my experience. Like, you know, coaching the Laurier men in 2016, I had four individuals, three of whom were good skips, right. Who are all on this team and it became ultra competitive, you know, through the entire season about even about what position they were going to play. So, you know, doing this competition thing in practice worked great because, you know, that was the way to sort of bring the testosterone up and say, okay, I'm going to compete against you and I'm going to win or you're going to lose or, you know, whatever. But I found in my experience that with women, the women's teams that I've coached, they just don't think that way. Everything is much more collective and collegial and it's not about head to head competition. Nobody wants to win when somebody else has to lose. Yeah, there is, there's definitely a different mindset. And so, like I say, I've done the Starbucks cards, but you know what, it isn't, it, it women just by their nature, sometimes we're our worst enemy. Um, but I think that on teams, uh, the togetherness factor can actually get in the way of uh, bringing out yeah. that competitive spirit. I agree. Yeah, for sure. We have a question. I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly, Dick. <laughs> How does maturity fit into all of this shopping? No, shopping is the second part about how you work with women to get them in. Oh. <laughs> so, Dick, though, I get that. <laughs> the, big, the big thing is, like, Jacques sounds very, very mature. And how do you deal with a 16 year old? It's, it's a great question. And I'm gonna let uh, him answer uh, <laughs> for the first part. Cause I'll tell you, maturity was not his middle name, not that long ago. <laughs> oh, Jacques. <laughs> no, that's, that's definitely true. Um, so yeah, that's a good question because it's funny enough that uh, Carly, so my girlfriend's dad's coaching a team at that, that's that age. And he's kind of asked me to, talk to them and stuff like that the biggest when I was that age I didn't I, I wanted to throw but I didn't want to throw that much because I didn't feel like there was tons to strive for like I didn't think that I had a lot of clear-cut goals that we could accomplish and I think that's a, that's a huge key is if you want to have motivation to do something you have to know what you're looking to do and so if you're a 15 16 year old team it's probably not reasonable to say okay well we want to win the U21s because every province is just so deep that it's really hard to do that. But you, if you set realistic goals for yourself, it's a little bit more manageable to do. So for example, when we were 16, we had our eyes set always on U18. It wasn't about U21. Our goal was just to qualify for U21, maybe upset a top team or something like that, or even something as small as when we played a guy like Matt Dunstone or Braden Calvert, when we were that age, we just wanted to be within one point of them late in the game. That's all we wanted. If we lost, if we were in the eighth end, down one, even without, down one without, not a good analytical spot to be in, but still making them sweat. And we gave up the three big whoop, but at least we scared them. That was our big goal when we were younger. It's just to scare teams. And so I think setting reasonable goals is a big way to kind of influence those that are maybe a little bit younger. I also think, um, you know, when I was coaching younger um younger athletes, we paired it with fun. There's that word. Um, because you know what, it's a bit of a grind. So you get out there. And what we used to do is when we practiced on Friday night, um, we always had a, an hour and a half practice. And then when it was over, we played shorts. That's what we call it in Manitoba. I don't know what you call it, but when you sit on the backboard and you just throw from there to the nearest house, yeah. 
And yeah. we would do that and it would be, you know, one against one and then one against another. And you'd kind of make it so that everybody played each other like a round robin. And uh, then there was a little prize. Here's the prizes again um, for a winner. And you know what, honestly, they enjoyed that the most. But I think that sometimes when you're dealing with younger athletes, if the fun factor is not there, um, it's a bit of a grind. The other thing I would say, <clears throat> um, the difference at the younger age, Dick, is the... Um, the maturity level with girls, the focus is here's we're in the building, we're curling. I know that boy talked to you and I know you don't like that, but to try to keep bringing them back. So I found that the, the pace that I changed drills at was really quick. We didn't do anything twice because I would lose them. The difference with boys, I think one of the challenges uh, is rage um, and anger. <laughs> um, you You're know, not wrong. I, I know. Uh, and, and managing that. Now, that's not coming out at a practice all the time, but I can absolutely say, and I will let him respond, that Jock became a 50, 60% better player. Okay, well, like maybe even a 90% better player. Um, okay, okay, you weren't shooting 10% before. But he became a way, way, way better player when he didn't let the emotions take over. Yeah. But how yeah. did you get to that point, Jay? A lot of it's perspective. Um, for the first few years, it was very frustrating because, like I said, we were playing guys like Braden Calvert, Matt Dunstone, who are almost slam teams, and you're playing them when you're 16. So you almost got to be perfect on every shot. So it kind of just got into my head that every time we play the game, I have to be almost perfect. And that's not the case, especially with juniors. Like you're going to get misses, um, you know, like it doesn't matter who you're playing. Everybody's human. You could be playing Brad Jacobs or a club team. Someone, st they still can miss because everybody's human. I think JT was a very, very good um, influence on me because he's a, if you know him at all, he's a very, very laid back guy. He doesn't get worked up too much. And so I just kind of, I looked at the way that he called the game and he played the game. And when I joined forces with him, he was still, he was arguably the better skip for sure because he beat us more times than not. And then playing under him, I realized how to be a good skip because he never got too fired up um, at all. And if he ever got upset, it was always his fault. Even if I flared an outturn peel and flashed it, he would always somehow blame himself for it. And so there was just, again, there was like that collective, um, you know, we're all in it together. You know, I flashed the peel, but he's the one that put the broom down kind of thing. Um, so I, I, perspective's the big thing, but just to kind of bring up what she said about the game thing before, um, a little funny note is that, so we'll have a two hour practice. We'll book a two hour practice here at our home club. An hour and a half of that is a very concentrated practice, throwing lots of shots, whatever, or something more concentrated on one shot like Botcher. But the last half hour is designated to this one game that we're, we're obsessed with right now. So we still have that aspect of fun. It, allow, it makes us push more for the hour and a half, knowing that we have that half hour after the fact to just kind of cut loose and have some fun. Uh, it's called Two Times. It's created by my cousin, actually, Tyler Tardy, and he showed us. It's very simple. Uh, he's got to create some sort of PDF to, to outline the rules, but it's basically just working on angles. It's, it's actually not a bad drill because you work on a bit of alignment, but you have two rocks and you're trying to hit one rock into another rock and it works on where you need to hit rocks to hit them. So like you master um, where to hit rocks for doubles or angles or just stuff like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a game for us and we have a good fun with it. So cool. Good. Any other questions, any comments? So Kathy, I, I wanted to reiterate um, something about what you said about having fun. So I had the opportunity to work with Jennifer Jones and her team uh, last week and, on brushing. And um, we're a good 45 minutes in. And Jennifer is looking over my shoulder and watching my screen and, and whatnot. And then she looks at me and she says, you have a lot of fun doing this, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. How did you know? And she's just from, 
you know, everything about you, everything that you do and how you say the words and, and everything else. And, and for you, it's all about fun. And she's the only person who has ever said that to me when I've done a brushing practice and I've done lots of practices with lots of different teams, but she recognized that right away. And so I'm not at all surprised that you <laughs> said what you said about how Jennifer approaches the game because it was right there with me. But it's a really good reminder. Mm -hmm. um, I like, and I do, I, I could send you guys clips where the word fun doesn't even fit in the sentence. It's like, yeah. you know, you were down four, the ice is really struggling. Caitlin just, Caitlin just fell on her head, but yeah. it's fun to be together when she falls on her head. I mean, <laughs> not, I mean, it's that kind of thing that there's nothing I can do to get that out. And I think yeah. that it's so prescriptive that it must be something that they have decided that is, they're just going to reinforce and reinforce and reinforce that to stay loose. Because yeah. for Jennifer and a team like hers, there really only is losing left. They have won everything there is to win. She could win a second Olympics, but she's one Canadian, she's one world. And yeah. so to get that motivation and to remind yourself sometimes that you're there because you love it. If you're not always gonna, gonna love it when you're losing, but overall, it still makes you happier than not playing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, thank you, Kathy. And Jock, that was sure. very insightful. Um, it's always nice to hear from people who've been there, who've had the experience. Um, you bring so much more perspective to all of us. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully this has recorded. It says it has. <laughs> so <laughs> this is our first kick at trying Zoom. We had a bit of a disaster with join me a few weeks ago not with this group but with a different group and uh, we wanted to try something different so Jen that's not me uh, Jen Ferris said let's try zoom so here we are so the recording will come out to you as usual please uh, remember that it's for your personal use only or use with your teams if you wish to use any of Kathy's material um, please get in touch with her or with me and I'll put you in touch with Kathy in order to ensure that it's shared appropriately. So thank you all. We have no other webinars scheduled at the moment because we're going to be working on a coaching symposium that we're hoping to hold in February or March and it will be done virtually. So this was a, a little bit of a test for us to see how that would work. So if you have any feedback for me, anything that you'd like to see at a virtual uh, coaching symposium, please drop, get your ideas to me. It's going to be way more affordable than the last coaching symposium was that we had planned that we had to cancel because of COVID. So it will be something that everybody can participate in if they wish to. Thank you. Have a good evening all and please stay healthy. <laughs> hey, well, great to see everybody. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Thank Kathy. you. Everyone. Happy yeah. Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Halloween, Dick. <laughs>